Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the band was speckled and there were six Napoleons, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about why Dr. Watson was called James by his wife? Or of Sherlock Holmes' dining habits? Or what happened when he let a criminal escape? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Burt Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 325, The Love Life of Sherlock Holmes. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, uh, gosh, you know, I usually have some kind of quip here at the beginning. Uh, I don't know how to work love into the uh, fifth proposition of Euclid here, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> well, why don't you try the fourth proposition of Euclid, well, if the fifth is too... <laughs> You know, Euclid was so busy out there putting propositions out. You have to imagine that he was fairly successful with the opposite sex. (laughs) Oh, right. That's very good. I like that. Have you ever been propositioned by Euclid? No. Well, you know, only to the extent that he asked me to buy him a drink one day. (laughs) And, you know, I... I, I, say to the, I said to him, you know, the same thing I always say to people when they ask me to do that. I say, look, Euclid, this is a library, not a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Euclid, Yuki, baby, Yuki. let me tell you. Yuki. Oh. Well, uh, hey, And we then I not... said the thing he really liked to hear. I said, hey, that's, by the way, that's a nice abacus. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, lest this become a love triangle between the two of us and Euclid, let's move on to uh, this particular episode. This is the last in the series of the master's class where we're talking about an entry from Trevor Hall from his uh, 10 literary studies. Um, And it will be an interesting one, I think. Um, If you would like the show notes for this episode, which includes a link to the book, Uh, Simply go to ihose.co slash trifles325, all lowercase. That'll take you directly to our website. And if you haven't visited that website before, please do. You can poke around there, look at previous entries, uh, look at the archives of all of our shows. You can sort it by season or by category uh, or uh, simply sign up for email updates as well as to become a patron. For as little as a dollar a month, you can support everything that goes into this show, from the research and the hosting and all of the things that it takes to bring this kind of entertainment to the world on a regular basis. Just go to patreon.com slash trifles or sherlockholmespodcast.com. All right. So, as I said, last in the Trevor Hall version of the Master's class, we will be back again next month with um, our next author. So stay tuned for that. But in this case, this is the 10th entry in uh, the 10 literary studies that Trevor Hall refers to. And this particular study is The Love Life of Sherlock Holmes. Now, Bert, I was expecting a fairly short chapter. In this case, (laughs) Um, because I am not aware of too much in the the love life of Sherlock Holmes. And Trevor Hall opens by quoting T.S. Blakeney, 
uh, who has, uh, he said, told us of the brevity of conviction that Holmes's quote, experience of women was, of course, limited, unquote. And it's interesting because it brought to mind, at least to me, that famous list that Watson put together in chapter two of A Study in Scarlet, where he said Sherlock Holmes, his limits. And there were 12 different categories there, everything from literature to philosophy, astronomy, politics, botany, geology, chemistry, and on and on. But nothing in there with regard to the fairer sex. So we kind of have to explore our way through this along with Trevor Hall and T.S. Blakeney, uh, who also reminds us that uh, Holmes said that uh, in a sign of four, he said, I assure you the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning three little children for their insurance money. And um, Watson, of course, ended up with a wife out of that particular story. And uh, Holmes mentions... uh, of course, that uh, sneering and that, uh, you know, viewing love as an emotional thing, which is opposed to his, um, uh, his true cold reason that he values above all else. So it seems that we've already been set up in the beginning of this essay that uh, Sherlock Holmes really has no love life. Well, we are so set up, and I should point out to our listeners that we don't suggest that you should listen to us instead of reading Trevor Hall's 10 Literary Studies. So please consult this particular one and the entire book of Literary Studies on your own. One of the things you'll find is that in this essay, one of the reasons, as you just mentioned, it's so long, is that is that Trevor Hall uses it as an opportunity to settle some scores that we're not going to go into, areas where he disagreed with other Sherlockian scholars about matters that are sort of vaguely related to Holmes's love life, and he, he gets into that and takes apart their arguments, which is a lot of fun. But yes, to your point, it's pretty well established early on in Sign of Four and in Study in Scarlet that Holmes is not um, a, someone for whom uh, an appreciation of the opposite sex is uh, you know, a, a significant characteristic. Um, inside, and in fact, Trevor Hall says that sort of right away. He says, you know, this whole idea that Holmes disliked the female sex is probably based on sign of four and some of these references that Watson says, you know, at the end of the case that he's going to be, he's engaged now to Mary Morstan and Holmes groans and says he can't congratulate you. And then, you know, Holmes, of course, says also love is an emotional thing, and whatever is emotional is opposed to that true cold reason which I place above all things. I should never marry myself lest I bias my judgment. And then, in the following year, in A Scandal in Bohemia, Watson says, you know, very clearly to us, all emotions, and that one particularly, were abhorrent to his cold, precise, but admirably, admirably balanced mind. Uh, as a lover, he would have placed himself in a false position. He never spoke of the softer passion, save with a jibe and a sneer. Uh, well, and then Hall takes us into some of uh, T.S. Blakeney's things that T.S. Blakeney ig- ignored. He said, you know, Blakeney's ignored a great deal of available uh, evidence. Um, Holmes demonstrates repeatedly that he was thoroughly familiar with the subtleties of feminine psychology. He had to tell Watson, this old campaigner whose experience of women, you know, was vast, that while Miss Mary Sutherland, in a case of identity, oscillated upon the the pavement, it meant an affair of the heart. And her restraint in not actually breaking the Baker Street bell wire meant that she had not been seriously wronged. You know, and again, Holmes had to explain to the bewildered Alexander Holder that his own niece was one of those women in whom the love of a lover extinguishes all other loves mm-hmm. in a barrel in the barrel coronet and then last you know in this early salvo here from hall what about the musgrave ritual rachel howells in regard to richard brunton her fiery and passionate 
emotions. Holmes had seen too much not to know that the impression of a woman may be more valuable than the conclusion of an analytical reasoner, which also comes from the man with the twisted lip. And then, how about Baron Gruner? You know, he knew that it might well be some lesser sin than a capital crime that would turn the infatuated Violet de Merville against him. Murder might be condoned or explained, yet some smaller offense might rankle. So all of this is, is Hall's arranging these little moments to indicate that, that these examples suggest much more robust and substantial um, appreciation of female psychology, psychology and um, deeper possibilities for Holmes' romance. Yeah, they, they really are. And, you know, when taken as a whole, these are all women who were um, aggrieved in some way. They are women who are in crisis, women who are dealing with some kind of disrupted emotional state. And Holmes mm -hmm. seems to have excelled in those kinds of areas. You know, here's Watson just kind of admiring uh, the, the figure and, and countenance of Mary Morstan. Well, Holmes really appreciates the true feminine psychology, particularly in times of trouble. And mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how... Uh, frequently Holmes interacted with women, um, certainly outside of uh, this kind of client relationship. Um, I think we can safely assume not much, um, but he was certainly an expert in the realm of women in need, women in crisis. And I think that's where we see him uh, you know, really uh, make a case for his understanding of not only human psychology, but, but very specifically female psychology. Um, Lady Trelawney Hope, right, in the second stain is a perfect example. Mm. Uh, we, we see her, you know, with her back to the window and, um, you know, uh, kind of pacing back and forth. And uh, Holmes really seemed to know uh, that she, uh, there was something there right, with her, her um, haunted face, startled eyes, drawn mouth. Uh, she uh, was very concerned about something. Holmes read into uh, the psychology behind what she was uh, trying to to tell him uh, in that uh, interaction. Yes, and to your point about Holmes and troubled women, he has a lovely habit of putting people at their ease and comforting them. And one example is in The Speckled Band, when... Mm. Helen Stoner shows up at Baker Street, clearly terrified. You must not fear, said Holmes soothingly, bending forward and patting her forearm. We shall soon set matters right, I have <laughs> no doubt. And so we have all these instances where, as you suggested, Holmes is in sympathy with ladies of distress. Yeah. And in fact, before Violet Hunter arrives at Baker Street in the case of the Copper Beaches, <laughs> Holmes thought that her call would be a perfect nuisance. He says, oh, I think I've touched bottom at last. But then when Holmes sees Violet Hunter and, and is impressed by her attitude, he's also, Watson tells us a lot about her appearance, but Holmes is impressed by her, her attitude and her forthrightness and her eloquence in describing, you know, what's on her mind. Uh, immediately, he's favorably impressed and says, you know, any time, a day or night, a telegram will bring me down to your help. He mm. thinks her to be quite, quite exceptional. And, um, yeah, I mean, know, he, and then when we encounter, yeah. Well, he he, he called her young and beautiful. He uh, said to Watson that it, he wasn't surprised that such a girl should have followers, right? Right, um, well, that's Violet I, Smith oh, in shoot, Solitary wrong, Sorry, wrong Violet. Hunter Smith, wrong you know. Violet. They're all the same. The other violet. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 he goes from uh, th this notion of being uh, bent out of shape for having to deal with uh, what he thought would be a trivial kind of thing to it, it becoming uh, probably one of his more interesting cases. Yes. Well, well, and then in the essay, you know, after Hall gives us these really very thoughtfully selected and beautifully articulated examples that cause us to rethink Holmes's attitude. He does get into this uh, great period where he 
resuscitates some commentary by Sir Sidney Roberts um, and what Sir Sidney considered to be um, the whole of the evidence about uh, Holmes and his uh, uh, approach to the opposite sex, which he said happily we're not going to get into. <laughs> uh, well, you know what we are going to go into? A quick word from our sponsor. You know, at the Baker Street Journal, Bert, one of the great things about being a subscriber is there are so many pieces and very well-written and insightful pieces from uh, the fairer sex, from women who are Sherlockians. And that's uh, the thing that's always been fascinating to me for as long as the history of some Sherlockian societies had excluded women in the earlier part of the 20th century. The women have always been wonderful contributors, wonderful scholars, and wonderful consumers of this kind of scholarship. Well, yes, and we've seen in the last, uh, you know, within the last 10 or 15 years, uh, a great number of articulate and talented women who have a lot to say about the world of Sherlock Holmes. And just in picking up a copy of the Baker Street Journal that I happen to have um, to hand, I open it up, and this is a copy from autumn of 2014, and find um, Lucy Kiefer, or Kiefer reporting uh, on Victor Trevor. We have Maria Fleischach writing about disguise and Germans in the canon. Sonia Featherston writing an essay, Everyday Offenders into Gibus Wearing Sophisticates. Um, you know, there's just, there's just no end to the interesting topics that articulate people can um, find a home for in the Baker Street Journal. There really isn't. And um, Sonia, together with Julie Mercurius, wrote last year's Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual, which was Women on the Periphery looking at women who were associated with or near the BSI between 1940 and 1960. So some of those earliest purveyors from the fairer sex. If you'd like to read more about this, read more from these women, just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and take out a subscription to the Baker Street Journal today. Well, we're back talking about the love life of Sherlock Holmes. I can't believe we're still going on about this, Bert. <laughs> we, we had well, skipped. Trevor Hall, yeah, we've skipped a big part of it. Trevor Hall, Trevor Hall takes us next to Irene Adler. And he says, you know, it's true that Holmes admired Irene Adler's intelligence, but it may be thought that her intellectual capacity had nothing to do with the emotions aroused by, quote, her superb figure outlined against the lights of the hall. And the fact that she was, in Holmes's words, the daintiest thing under a bonnet on this planet. And, of course, Holmes has great preference for her photograph rather than another, an, uh, an additional enormous fee from the king of Bohemia. Um, you know, and so uh, this is part of Hall's arrangement of evidence that Holmes was knowledgeable as he describes it in, uh, or he says, Holmes was adept in the simpler aspects of the arts of love. And, um, you know, there's a lovely example about that in the Milverton case, mm. where Holmes is gone for quite a while as part of that investigation and then comes back and then all have, has this remarkable conversation with Watson where he says, you would not call me a marrying man, Watson? <laughs> You will be interested to hear, I am engaged. <laughs> <laughs> my, oh, dear my dear fellow, fellow I congrats to Milverton's housemaid. <laughs> Good heavens, Holmes. <laughs> I wanted information, Watson. <laughs> right? Making it very clear that he had no emotional or romantic attachment to this woman. She was merely a pawn in his game. Which yes, is, but it clearly was a whirlwind courtship. So Holmes had some sure. ability to to form an affection with her, and and he didn't feel too badly about it because he knew there was a hated rival who would cut 
cut him out the uh, the instant his back was turned, he said. Um, but but Hall writes, it's reasonable to presume that Agatha, the housemaid, although doubtless pretty, was a simple child of nature who could scarcely be attracted by any spiritual or intellectual attributes in her followers. Uh, and uh, Holmes, of course, was in the guise of a rakish young workman with no advantages of wealth and position to help him in his efforts. It follows, therefore, that his successful lovemaking must have been entirely on a tempestuous physical plane to sweep Agatha off her feet. To accomplish this in a few days in cold, frosty winter weather means the affair must have been a passionate one and that Holmes was fully experienced in such amorous adventures. Well, <laughs> that that's interesting because let's not forget that I think it was uh, Thelney Jones in The Sign of Four who said that Holmes was an actor and a rare one. And could Holmes have not picked up from maybe attending some theatrical performances from watching melodramas played out on stage, picked up some um, techniques, shall we say, uh, techniques that he would have known that such a, an individual as Agatha would have been predisposed and use those to his advantage. So perhaps not necessarily feeling them himself or having experience with them himself, but simply putting on an act based on something that he had once seen. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Putting on an act. Yeah, that is interesting. Well, we are now at the end of Trevor Hall's essay, and at the conclusion, Hall points us back to the barrel coronet, where he says, you know, this, this was a rather remarkable thing that Holmes said to Mr. Alexander Holder. He said, you owe a very humble apology to that noble lad, your son, who has carried himself in this matter as I should be proud to see my own son do, should I ever chance to have one. Hmm. Uh, well, now that, says Hall, uh, seems to me to be a, a rudimentary precognition of the future birth of his son out of wedlock. And at the end of the essay, Hall reviews speculations by William S. Baring Gould about the possibility that Holmes and Irene Adler did have a child. And we don't desperately need, I don't think, to go through all of that. But we do. <laughs> well, who, who, we do. Was, who was that child, according to, uh, to Baring Gould? Ah, well, that was Nero Wolf. <laughs> and that, and that's, that was, that's a topic for an entirely different episode i think that's true that's true and and hall ends here by saying you know gee if such a if such a son was ever born um why is it that um he has never been never before now been a guest of honor at one of the many sherlock holmes societies in the old <laughs> world or in the new world uh that's fun that is fun. Well, you know, I'm I'm brought back to something that I don't think Hall covered in this essay. At least if he did, I didn't see it. And that was uh, the conclusion of The Devil's Foot. Uh, as they're assessing, you know, Leon Sterndale and his, um, you know, avenging uh, the death of Brenda Tregenis. Um, Watson, or Holmes says, uh, I have never loved Watson. Mm. But if I did... And if the woman I loved had met such an end, I might even act as our lawless lion hunter has done. Who knows? <laughs> what an opportunity for Watson to have said, okay, Holmes, you've never loved, but have you liked? <laughs> <laughs> Only on Facebook, Watson. <laughs> well, and that is really a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. 
I have never loved. But if I did, and if the woman I had loved had met with such an end, I might act, even as our lawless lion hunter has done. Wouldn't you? <laughs> 